fine. And so I couldn't get healthy. I couldn't stay healthy. And, and they fired Lenny after my first two years. And it was, I, you know, that burden, that is a stain and stigma on my soul. I've been responsible for far too many coaches who have been fired because I have not been able to play. And Lenny Wilkins was the first one of many. But then they bring in Jack Ramsey. And Jack Ramsey, brilliant. Jack was the coach who made me the best player I ever was, Ben. But Jack went around to each of the 12 guys on the team and had an individual meeting with all of us. And then, and he immediately went back into the office after he met with me as the final guy on, on his rounds. He went into the office and said, this is not going to work. These guys just don't like each other. There's no team chemistry. We got to trade them all. And so they listened to Jack and they, where they didn't listen to Lenny. And so Jack was able to make all these moves and create a team in his image and in his dream and in his vision. And it's a tremendous testament to what you need to do when you're running a team is that you got to let the guys who know about basketball make the decisions as to who's going to be on the team mm -hmm. not a bean counter and, and and not some guy who watches tv a lot and so that jack and lenny is fantastically brilliant but we also had the remarkable harmonic convergence of the the assimilation of the four teams from the aba and then the NBA dispersal draft. And so Jack made a brilliant trade with Hubie Brown, which uh, Hubie was coaching Atlanta, and Hubie hated Maurice Lucas. <laughs> Maurice Lucas had threatened to kill him one time. <laughs> and so when they, were, when, they, when they were in the ABA, and so Jack made this brilliant trade to get the draft rights or the dispersal rights to Maurice Lucas as the number two pick. Number one pick was Artis Gilmore to Chicago, and Artis was just tough as can be to play against because Artis had no comprehension that there were rules, <laughs> rules like that. Three seconds, double dribble, offensive fouls, traveling. And then we also got, you know, we, we got, I think we got seven new players. And uh, mm -hmm. Dave Torzik out of the ABA. We got Herm Gilliam that came as a free agent. Uh, got uh, Johnny Davis in the draft. Johnny Davis, the fastest guy I've ever seen play basketball. We ended up, you know, J Jack Ramsey, he loved, he loved the same things that we all love. The speed game, fast, up and down full court pressure, man-to-man -man defense, just to get the tempo going. And then we, you know, we have the fastest backcourt in the history of the NBA. Uh, Lionel Hollins and Johnny Davis. And then Dave Twardzik was exquisite too. Dave, Dave was incredibly quick mentally. He was, you know, he, he was a six foot center when, when, when Dave uh, played high school and college basketball and he got the NBA and he just became a brilliant, brilliant player for our team. Then we had Bob Gross, who outplayed everybody. Bob was a completely selfless person, had no interest in stats himself. He was the butt of all Jack Ramsey's ire. Everything, everything that went wrong, if it did, not much did go wrong, but Bobby Gross always got blamed for it. But Bobby outplayed everybody he ever <laughs> played against. And then we had the greatest, the greatest blazer of them all and the greatest teammate that I've ever had. And the namesake of Luke Walton, we had Maurice Lucas. Incredible. You know, we started this show with the Celtic fans. We had the Blazer fans and the Blazer the fans. Blaze. The Blazer fans were like the Celtic fans are now. And it was just, you know, where they would just come ready to play, ready to fight, and they would never let us down. And they just drove us and they pushed us. And Because you know, when you're playing in these big, big games and you get tired, I mean, you're putting everything into it and you just like, oh, my God, you're carrying this incredibly heavy burden. And the nutrition of those days, Ben, was nothing. I mean, you know, we, they wouldn't even let us drink water during the games. In those but were, were you, you were, <laughs> that was, you had already had veganism at that point, right? 60s, 70s. Already had, v one. you were a vegan at that point, right? No, man, I ate okay. everything and I still eat everything. <laughs> um, no. yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so here's that. Can I, that all stuff, all that stuff came about because I couldn't play because of the endless string of undiagnosed stress fractures. I mean, if I had not had those structural congenital defects in my feet that led to the endless string of stress fractures, I would have been fine. And, and all this nonsense that people spread out there about other people who don't, you know, they don't know anything about, they just, they think something. And so they say something and that's just the way life works. And that's, that's the risk we assume when we go into this world and 
so I, I always, you know, had the approach that I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be me. And mm-hmm. I try my best to be just like I am. Everybody wants me to be just like him. Well, I'm not him. Bill, I'm me. Bill, and so Bill, you are the most you person I have ever met <laughs> in my entire life. And I'm going to tell people. You a need story. to get Let out Bill, more, can, Richard. Bill, can I tell a story? So this is yeah. the thing. So like, again, I am in, in, I grew up in the same generation, the same area. It was NBA on NBC. I don't know Luke Walton, but I know his dad. His dad is Bill Walton. So when me and Luke are being roommates, we're roommates, and it's like our first day in the dorm. Our first day in the dorm, I've told this story before. So we have a little answer machine because it's 1998, everyone had it. And so I remember clicking on it, an answer machine, and it's a message from you, Bill. And I'm like, oh, my God, the guy that I'm hearing calling Michael Jordan's game is calling our phone. Like, this is mind-blowing to me. And so all of a sudden, it's like, Bill, or I was like, Luke, this is your father, Bill. I repeat, Luke, this is your father, Bill. I need you to send, I talked to Lute Olson, and they said that they were sending something home. I want to send the address. The address is blank, 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 blank. I still know the address. Blank, 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 blank. And I'm like, and I look at Luke super confused, and I'm like, hey, Luke, like, did your dad just move or something? Like, why why is he leaving your address twice? Does he, does he live someplace else? And he's like, Richard, and Luke just put his head down. He goes, Richard, my parents are hippies. They were hippies. They still are hippies. Um, I was born in the downstairs bedroom at that house, the same house that Bill still lives in. And every time he calls, he will leave his address twice. He will say who he is twice, and he will leave the phone number twice. And that was my first introduction to the beautiful you version of Bill. You never want to assume that anyone knows <laughs> That's why I always introduce myself and to make sure they, they know who it is that's speaking. I'm Bill yeah. from San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. Mary yeah. Delory, the greatest everything ever. And she is our CEO, our chief everything officer. She is and, and what she was team. able to do to make a home of uh, 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 joy and happiness and hope and optimism that, that I always found in basketball but uh, struggled to find in my own personal life. Uh, but now I'm madly in love and more so than ever uh-huh. as uh, I just haven't been married to Lori long enough. And, and, and all the great things we've done. I just want to apologize for you to you uh, for getting you kicked out of college basketball because I took you to an NBA finals game. I mean, I, yes, I thought that's yes. what parents did for their yeah. children. Well, well and the first of all, look, and I'll apologize to you because Bill kicked me out of his house multiple times. It's like, get out of here. You guys are just causing chaos. Bill really did. I used to sleep on his couch all the time. But, Bill, let's stop talking about us. I want to talk about some current NBA stuff, right? Yeah. You are, you are widely considered one of the greatest passing big men of all time. And there are some great ones. I want to talk about Jokic, a guy that won the MVP last year, who I have never seen. I didn't have the pleasure of being able to watch you in your prime, but right. when I watch Jokic, what do you see with him, the way he passes? Because I feel like you guys see the game the same way. What do you see from Jokic? I see Mozart. I see Chopin. Mm-hmm. I see Liszt. I see Larry Bird. I see Joe Montana. I see Pelé. I see someone who sees things before they happen. And, you know, Jerry Garcia, Mickey Hart, Bill Kreutzmann. Bob Weir, all these Bob Dylan, all these visionaries, these these incredible performers and creators. And but the story for Jokic right now is is a story of sadness because ultimately you you are only as good as your teammates. And with the injuries that the Denver Nuggets have, and and right now they're just seriously outmanned. So it's disappointing and frustrating. And with the brilliance of the Golden State Warriors and how. They're playing right now. and Offense wins, and, they, and those guys, they can fill it up. But they're also, the Warriors, incredibly fit, totally disciplined, committed. And so they get these undersized guys who play really, really fierce defense. And they get up in your face, and they have made the decision, okay, we are going to make Jokic beat us with his scoring, which is the way you approach a great passer. But I was lucky in that I started playing basketball as a very young boy, eight years old. My parents, zero interest in sports. I, my parents had no impact on my sport career at all. My parents, I never shot a basket with my dad. My mom was our town's librarian. Never talked sports with my parents. But I had this brilliant coach, my first coach, Rocky, 
who I'm sure you met years ago. And Rocky, uh, he was the volunteer coach at our elementary school for 59 years. And when he died just a few years ago, he was the richest guy I've ever known after never taking a penny from coaching <laughs> all these children. But because of Rocky, because of Chick Hearn, you know, it was the culture of the team game. And the team game for me was Bill Russell. And Bill Russell, my favorite player ever. I never played against Bill. Uh, great friend. From my perspective, I don't speak for other people. But, you know, Bill Russell, what he did, I mean, he was very much like Steve Nash. One day I, when I was working uh, on the NBA, I wrote a column that, that said that, that Bill Russell and Steve Nash are the same person. And uh, we'll have to get somebody to dig that column up and, and, and repost that on ESPN.com. But, you know, it was the same way when they asked me about John Wooden and Larry Bird and Jerry Garcia. And you know, they're the same person, too. And so, and so that sense of, of playing to win. I, you know, I, I, was, I, I grew up in the John Wooden, Chick Hearn culture. Rocky, and, uh, my high school coach, Gordon Nash, was our biology teacher. He was fantastic. <laughs> And so uh, I studied biology in college, yes. And so it was fantastic that uh, I learned that success comes from the team game and, and you have to do everything. I mean, that, that was John Wooden basketball. Every player does everything. And then you, you win the game by winning every single possession. And then, and then he would always tell us, just win the game by 30 points so that the refs don't have anything to say about how this comes out. Well, there you go. There you go. Ben, what do you got for Big so, Bill? Well, uh, yeah, is Bill still there? That's the question. There we are. We're back. Bill is Bill's, B- Bill's back. back. We briefly lost him. So, no, so, man, somebody was, uh, somebody was trying to call me and harass me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is it fair to say then, in terms of where this passing came from, you know, this, this passing ability that you had, is it? I started as a guard. I started okay. you know, when I was eight years old and I, and I, and I tried to play like Pete Maravich and Jerry West. And, and I was just flying all over the court and just, you know, had the ball in my hand all the time and, and got all the rebounds and raced it up the court and took all the shots, passed the ball. And, and, you know, that's how you learn how to play. And I always played up and, And then, so I was just going and going. And then when I was 13, I was playing against some really old guys. They were in their thirties and I was torching them down at the gym and uh, they didn't like it. And so they just took me down with a high low and I tore up my knee and I had to have my first operation just a few months later. And I was 14 by then. And then the doctor at that time, they, they didn't know what to do. So they just said, go home and lie in bed for the next three months. And when I got up out of bed, I had grown six and a half inches and my parents, my wow. parents were aghast, uh, but the the biology teacher, our high school basketball coach, Gordon Ness, he was ecstatic. And then I changed my, <laughs> and then I changed my game. I changed my game to, uh, to to play more like Bill Russell, and you know Bill Russell, he did everything. You know he controlled everything and never had the ball. And so I and I, and I love the fast break game, and I love starting the fast break, block shots, rebounds, deflections, in, interceptions, even taking the ball out of the net and starting the fast break. And just, just to be a part of the great team, that was my whole deal. I wanted to be a part of something great. And so the choices that I've made in my life, you know, to, to be a deadhead, to go on tour with Bob Dylan and Neil Young and John Fogarty and, ja- and Jackson Brown and Jimmy Cliff and all those guys, and to be part of the NBA, some of the greatest teams ever, the Blazers, the Celtics. And I sure wish we had had Steve Ballmer as the owner of the Clippers when we were there. <laughs> the Clippers. That guy, Steve Ballmer. Yeah. That guy he's excellent. And I just, I just hope one day that Steve and the Clippers and their incredible management team, that they get the, the health break that, that you have to have because I, I, just heart, yeah, I was I, heartbroken when I saw Devin Booker go down the other night. It's just terrible. And, I, and I, I, I hate to see anybody ever get injured. I liked it when everybody's playing at full speed. And I'm so glad that Steph is back at it and, 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 and hopefully that can, that can c- continue because when I watch stuff on TV, I mean, I'll be like all by myself here in the house and I got the game on and I'm yelling at it. I'm yelling at the TV when he's, when he's bringing the ball up the court, 
you know, 75 feet from the court, shoot it, shoot it from there. <laughs> and the people next door Bill. who live next door, and they live quite a bit away. We, you know, we have a lot of privacy here at the house, but the people next door, they think I'm calling for somebody to start shooting weapons. And then, oh, no, no, I want Steph Curry to shoot a 75 footer out there because I was there in Cleveland, NBA 75, when, uh. when Steph went for 50 on. 16 made baskets <laughs> and so i immediately texted him and uh and i said okay i i, I saw the 50 on 16 now i want to see yeah. 70 on on 23 makes so let's go oh, wow that's you that's what you're gonna but bill I, okay really talk i want to go back to the your celtics not your celtics but the celtics like the way that the Celtics team and just the Celtic franchise and what they're doing this year, the amazing defense, Marcus Smart, the defensive player of the year, you and I have learned more basketball from talking to you and, and learning the way you see the game. What do you see from this amazing Celtic? They have so far bottled up Kevin Durant, one of the greatest offensive weapons that any sport has ever seen. Right. They have bottled him up in two games. Like, What are you seeing there? From the Kevin Durant side, as a guy that was like the most dominant figure in a series to lead a team to win, but also from the defensive side from the Celtics. You you don't have to convince me how great Kevin Durant is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin, you know, when, when I look at the NBA today, you know, the, the, there's so many great players. And, and, you know, Richard, you were one of those guys who came in like, a, you know, on the heels of Scottie Pippen. And, and, you know, that's the kind of body and game that you have and just incredible all-around total player. And now today, you know, there are billions of those guys everywhere. It's mm-hmm. like they've had a 3D printer in the NBA <laughs> office, right? And, and, but then, you know, so, so I could list so many different players, but the, the four guys that I really see controlling the league right now because – I, you know, I don't really look at the stats. I mean, because you can always make, you can always find a stat that will back up your position. I, I, I look at the guys who I think are controlling the league, and uh, you, you have to be healthy. But it's uh, to, to me right now, it's KD and it's Giannis and it's Steph Curry and it's LeBron James. And LeBron has not been healthy. And you know, LeBron's career is spectacular, speaks for itself. But KD is one of those you know, once in a lifetime type players and what he's able to do and, and, and control and win the games and score and rebound and block. And what, what the Celtics have made the Nets do, I mean, because you got two of my favorites ever. You got Kevin Durant and you got Steve Nash on the same team and you got Joe Sy owning it and Oliver Weisberg running the show there. And it's just fantastic what they've done with the Brooklyn Nets. But the Celtics have made the Nets stand on offense and, mm-hmm. you know, and and then try to beat you off the dribble. Now, today's players, that's the way they play, is off their own dribble. That has been a complete cultural change that really came about with the ascension to the very top of the mountain of Michael Jordan. And then from that point on, that's the way everybody has played. Now, the best teams still pass the ball a lot, but still so many of the shots are taken off your own dribble. And the, the cultural shift, what we had as, as players was if you were dribbling, you were supposed to be dribbling to pass it to somebody else who would be wide open because wide open players make shots. And it's incredibly rare that, that players, even the greatest players, make shots off their own dribble. Now, they do it today, but that's how great the players are today. But when it mm-hmm. comes now to the grind and the push and the shove of the playoffs, when every possession, and the, just the, the focus, the determination, one of the reasons why the playoff basketball is at a higher level is because there's so much less travel during the playoffs. And, you know, you're, you're traveling once a week as opposed to traveling every single day. And the players are fresher and the players are stronger and they're bigger. And so this guy, Imi Adoku, is it Adoku? Is that, am I saying his name right? Yudoka. Yeah. Yudoka, sorry. And uh, I, I beg your pardon. You guys from Portland, I, I should know all this stuff. Yudoka. Y- Yudoka, right? Yeah, look, there's a lot of different so, iterations of it, Bill. He know, just call him Imi. Okay, Imi. I like that. Richard, Bill. 
uh, and, said, <laughs> and Ben, sorry. Uh, and so, uh, so Ime has got these guys to believe that they can guard that, and they're in shape and they are up in people's faces and they are disciplined in their approach to their defense. And, but ultimately, you know, this Celtic net series is far from over because mm-hmm. ultimately, you know, the, the team with the best players win in the NBA. And when you look at the Brooklyn Nets, I mean, they got, they got Kevin Durant and they got Kyrie Irving and that, you know, mm-hmm. and now you on the Celtic side, you got Jason Tatum and you got Jalen Brown. Jalen, Jalen Brown was the most together 19 year old person I've ever encountered in my life. I had the privilege mm-hmm. at the conference of champions broadcaster. I think I did 15 of his games in the one year he was at Cal and it was just staggering in terms of his impressive nature as a human being, much less as a remarkable basketball player. But now these guys, they're all, they're all committed. And and, and think back to the Celtic, the Celtic history with, you know, with Bill Russell as the anchor of the initial franchise to success when they won all the championships, because they had to go against Wilt and Oscar and Elgin and Jerry and Bob Pettit. I mean, these are great, great players. And the Celtics were, were not able to beat those guys until Bill Russell got there. And then when the ultimate test, you know, we talked about having to guard artist Gilmore. How about the ultimate test of having to guard Will Chamberlain? And so Bill, wow. Bill Russell, he told his teammates, hey, man, the way we're going to win is that I will guard Wilt. Don't you guys come and help me. I'll guard Wilt. Wilt will have huge numbers. And Wilt had his biggest numbers against Bill Russell and the Celtics. I'll guard Wilt. You stay at home on your guys. And then we'll play the team offensive game at the other end with our fast break. I'll get the rebounds. We'll start the fast breaks. I'll block some shots. We, you guys just run, 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 run. And then and then we're going to win the game. And Wilt had magnificent, stupendous, outrageous, historical numbers. But the Celtics won all those games. And so – What the Celtics have to do is to continue with their philosophy and their strategy where they have going against the Nets right now, but understand that it's going to be a whole lot different because that Celtic crowd as our Blazer crowd, as our UCLA crowd, as your Arizona crowd was so fantastic, that drives you to to, to higher levels of performance. And now are they going to be able to do that on the road against these incredible players who will come and, and play even better with greater sources of energy. So, Bill, can we go back a second when you were talking about... We can uh, go anywhere you want. I Steph. love tripping through the universe here. So, okay, so you're talking about yelling at your television about Steph Curry shooting deep threes, and we've yeah. touched on Durant and Kyrie and Jokic. Who are the players today that, that get you the most excited to watch, that give you the most joy to watch, that maybe sparked that feeling back when you were... You know, playing for Coach Wooden and Coach Ramsey, Ramsey and back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we, played, we played for Casey Jones, too. We, you know, Casey was on those teams with Bill Russell all the time. And it was just uh, the, the players, you know, I love the, you know, I love the great crowds. Uh, the Celtic crowd was over the top. The Toronto crowd in last night's game was magnificent and fantastic. The Philly crowd. The, generally, the best teams have the best crowds. And, uh, you know, when San Antonio was on top of the world, they had fantastic crowds. I'm old enough to remember the baseline bums. And when David Cow- when Dave Cowens was trailing on a fast break one time, they had been riding Dave, the, the baseline bums in the old hemisphere. And as the play just kind of unfolded on the flow to the basket area, Dave comes running up the court and just kept r- running right by the basket up into the stairs. Cold Cox, one of the baseline bums, turns around and runs back and gets in the defensive transition. So it was, you know, I, I love the fans and I love the players, but at the top for me is uh, KD and and Giannis and Steph and LeBron. But LeBron's out right now, and uh, and Steph has been out, uh, but uh, but he's back right now. And we hope it continues. But I love the team game. And the Celtics right now are playing a team game, and it's just absolutely beautiful. You know, they have they have uh, uh, some scores, some talent, but uh, you know, ultimately, you know, your best when you when you're going to the win, when you're going for the win, your best players have to be better than their best players, and that's what's happened so far. Uh, you know, Tatum, Jason Tatum, superb. Nice to see Coach K 
uh, Coach Shire there in attendance last night, the guest of Steve Paliuka, and and then Marcus Smart, his big, fantastic uh, performances. You know, the, those big moment plays that, you know, that when I was on the Celtics, when I was on the Celtics, you know, we had Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Harris, Dennis Johnson, Danny Yane, Scott Wedman, Jerry Seasting, Rick Carlisle, and, and and me and it was like okay we had a team you guys, and you guys had a 